Chapter 8. To Iani, all is entertainment. What counts only is what we do with the instruction received. The other day, Maharaj was talking about Brahmananda and how during Dhyana, people get absorbed in that. There is something very different about a true sage compared with a yogin who becomes more and more absorbed and otherworldly. Somehow, Maharaj has broken through all that and his presence seems very ordinary and normal, alert to the environment. At the same time, you know he is constantly in a state of bliss, awareness, which is beyond our comprehension, and yet with this paradox of complete release and ordinary appearance. This does not seem explained at all by increasingly subtle absorption, where there is either consciousness of the world or absorption in consciousness. Maharaj has just received some medicine and a list of do's and don'ts from his doctor. I am not concerned in keeping this life force alive, because whatever disease has come, it has not come on me but on this beingness. So from now on, these do's and don'ts will be only according to whatever that life force feels like doing, and I shall not accept either the do's or the don'ts from the doctor. So whatever the life force feels like doing, it will do, and whatever the beingness wants to do, it will do. Interpreter the question of medicines is mentioned by a number of sages who suffered from the same disease, or rather those whose bodies suffered from it. The most famous ones in my galaxy all had cancer, Ramakrishna, Ramana Maharshi, and Nizargadatta. Their devotees explained that the reason these sages got the disease was because of what they assumed in terms of karma. A very crude explanation. Does Maharaj place any credence in that at all? It seems a terrible burden to bear. As far as I am concerned, I have no experience of any kind of birth. Only at a certain stage was I told that this form had been born, and this is me. This is what I have been told, hearsay. The ignorant man will want to live as long as he can. He would like to postpone the moment of a death as much as possible. Before a yani, what benefit of any kind can he expect by existing in the world even one more minute? So the only thing that would be nice is for the vital breath to leave quietly and not make a fuss. The yani is that principle which dismisses the life force and the consciousness. The consciousness and the life force together may be given the highest name and status. That is Atman, Ishwara, whatever. But the yani is not even that. The Ani is apart from even that highest category. Having understood what the consciousness is and the life force is, I have never gone to anyone and asked whether my view is correct or incorrect. Once you have understood the whole point, there is no need for you to stay here any longer. As for myself, having understood this life force and the consciousness, I do not have any interest at all in either one. People have been coming here and I have been talking. Why have I been talking? Because the lifespan has to be spent. It has to be used. So even that is merely entertainment. Something has to be done. This is entertainment. Whiling away the time. The lifespan. The name is the giving of knowledge. But what is the game? A game of cards. Entertainment. The name is spiritual knowledge. The game is cards. Addressing a particular lady in the audience. Now that you have understood, you don't have to come any more. If I asked someone to come, it would be common sense that I want him to do so for some reason. That he may give some money or write a book about me or do something which may be for my benefit. Normally, only then would anyone ask somebody to come. But here, there is nothing of this sort going on. There are neither worldly nor unworldly benefits involved. So no one needs to come. Tell him we like his entertainment. The name and the purpose is spiritual knowledge. But the game is playing cards. Tell him I am no good at cards. Whatever you have heard, have you understood and will it stay with you? And if it will, honestly, there is no need for you to keep coming. We are not preventing you, but you need not come. However, you may come if you want. The lady in question is pointing at her watch. The lady's spiritual seeking is of a high order. She has golden bonds of filial and family affection. Everything is entertainment. Are there any questions? Interpreter. Everybody is totally against Maharaja's consuming tobacco. 
He had one doctor after another telling him so. He says that everybody is dead against my consuming tobacco. They say, don't have coffee, don't have this, don't have that. So he says he may reduce it, but he is certainly not going to stop it altogether. And for what? Only to be alive? A little longer? Is it not? He says even Vishnu, Rama, Maheshwara had a limited lifespan. Why worry about this? There is no necessity to come here for any blessing. No blessing can be given to you. No change can be made in you. No instruction whatsoever can be given to you. You were perfect, even before you came here. And you will be returning absolutely perfect without even a dent on you. One has to learn through one's mistakes, then. Who said that you have made a mistake? When you understand that you are perfect, only then do you know that a mistake has been made. This you can know only when you understand your true position. Then you will know that mistakes were made. So when are you going to correct the mistakes? Is there any time? Actually not. There is only the realization of it. Any questions? Interpreter. He is so confident, you see, because whatever question you are going to put, you are framing it through your conditioning. And he knows he is beyond all conditions and can therefore answer any question. So he is always ready to answer you, and you are always trying to prepare the question through the conditioning of your mind, through whatever you have learned, acquired, all those things. So put any question you like, because he can answer you very confidently. He confers such a profound knowledge through the few words which he utters, and he does it all in an extremely fetching manner. Now he says, I am just whiling away the time. I want to pass the time. Therefore I talk. Otherwise I don't want to talk at all. That is his greatness. To a yani, giving out the profoundest knowledge is also only whiling away the time, since he knows the truth about everything. It is all happening in a dream. He is answering you in the dream. You are coming here in a dream. What is to be answered correctly in a dream? And what do you understand correctly in the dream? The moment the dream leaves, everything goes away. You see, he is absolutely certain about the true situation. That is all. Does this mean, then, that everything is preconditioned? Did I suggest that everything is preconditioned? Nothing is happening, so where is the condition? When things happen by themselves? Yes, in the objective way, things are happening by themselves. In your dream, the things happen of themselves, or you make them happen. In the same way, things are also happening here. Whatever is applicable in the dream is applicable here also. If you want to call it a sort of system, there is no system that way. Very simply put, the vital force is moving. It is its nature to move. And whatever words come, the meaning of that word is the mind. Unless and until you have the vital force, you cannot speak. You cannot do anything. The mind will work only if you have the vital force. Now take a scientific view. No work is necessary in order to initiate the state of knowledge. But when you are in a state of knowledge, you can do any work. You must not keep yourself idle. So do go on working. Whether working for the poor, the community, or for progress, whatever it is that you do, be at that state of knowledge, of real consciousness. But when you ask me whether work will help in one's realization, my answer is that nothing helps there. Realization is first, then the work starts. Duality is lost. He knows that. He has experienced it. I do not have that experience. Expounding knowledge is an absolutely rare thing in India. People keep to themselves and then disappear. I have no explanation for the talks that go on here. The knowledge that is being expounded? It just happens. It is the greatest miracle. But note how few people take advantage of it. You may have observed this from your own experience. You must have seen a number of Indians come here. What are they coming for? For their physical well-being. What is happening is that these poor people were actually to be dead. They are as though they are dead, but they have survived because of the company involved. Are they doing any sadhana? That is very difficult to say. Most of them are barely surviving. They are not very active. They suffer from poor health and can't come every day. 
but they acknowledge they are alive because of this place. One of the things that seems to me an important guiding principle in my work is the determination of whether it is worth trying to maintain life when there is still a possibility of consciousness and that person wants to use it appropriately. Otherwise, I can't see any point in keeping the body alive. I don't see it honors life at all. Interpreter. You must have heard about his own daughter who expired. She was on her deathbed, so Maharaj, as was his normal practice, was going out in the evening. And when he was about to leave home, Maharaj's wife was also leaving at that time. So she said, Your daughter is almost dying. Why must you leave right now? He said, Don't worry. I will be back in a second. She wants something to drink. I shall bring her that drink, some cold drink. But upon Maharaj's return, he found the girl dead. Then Maharaj kept the glass containing the drink on the table and looked at that. She got up and drank it. He said, I brought it. You had told me. After she had finished, Maharaj asked, Do you want to live? She said no, and she fell down again. There is no doer at all. No one has an identity to do anything. In the field of consciousness, everything just happens. That is why it is so important that these teachings should become more widely known in the United States, for example. They're going to be very hard to swallow because there is such a strong sense of doership there and such a great deal of personal pride and achievement. The whole of society is structured around praising people and categorizing them in terms of what they have apparently achieved. Here in India, it is said that one in a thousand is desirous of knowing himself and one in a million actually knows. There is some saying of that kind. People who want only knowledge. I actually love such people more than my own relatives. People who value self-knowledge. They are dearer to me than my own children. And he looks after them pretty well, encouraging them and seeing that they are doing their lessons. They will be all right. Maharaj is addressing himself to a visitor in monastic garb. I am telling you that if you receive the knowledge from me, then this dress will be of no use to you. You will have a less common dress. Does it mean that I will take off the robe? No, that will be your decision. On your own, you will do it, without my telling you once you know what is the truth. Is there no point at all in a methodical approach like meditation? No use. To reach this knowledge, there is no practice at all, no specific practice. Then it arises all by itself? Then one does not do anything about it? You know the world, spontaneously, without any effort. Or have you put in an effort to know that the world is? I don't know if I put in any effort, but it is a mental creation, a reaffirmation of my own image of the world. Whether you have put in any effort to know that the world exists, or you just know that the world is, that is the question. Knowledge of the self is also like that. People teach that certain conditions must be ripe for realization, but then that would mean there are no special requirements. Knowledge cannot be ripe or raw like a fruit. You know that you are, that you have your eye consciousness. At present, you wrongly identify yourself as the body. Body is given a certain name. That is you. You consider it to be like that. But I say that in this body, consciousness is present, or the knowledge I am, as I call it, is there. You should identify yourself as this knowledge. That is all. How about one's livelihood? Does it happen by itself, or does one have to put in an effort to earn one's livelihood? It happens automatically, spontaneously. Just as you wake up and go to sleep similarly, this also happens. I have my robes on now. And if I decide to take them off, that would be another decision. Then there would be another condition, and I would do something else instead, and then, in effect, it would be the same. Further, this body is also a covering, and you have to understand that you are not that. You are not the covering. So that means, in a way, that the body takes care of itself. The body is nothing but food. But somehow we need food to survive. Whatever food you consume, that is converted into this body, ultimately. And this body, in turn, is the food for the consciousness. So you come with the food, you come with the body. The question is one of correctly identifying what you are. Advice to identify or not to identify with anything? 
Instead of taking yourself to be something, you should know what you are, really. I am going to Europe to visit my parents there, and I am certain they hold a certain view of me, and maybe it helps me in my situation just to ignore that completely. And perhaps they don't particularly like that I am in robes, because it creates a certain reaction in Europe. But I am not concerned about these things. Whatever dress you have, that does not matter so far as I am concerned. No, not the dress, but the attitude. For example, if I would take off the dress just to please my parents, that would be consenting to their views about myself. But that does not matter. You ask about yourself, your identity. If you attend these talks and then, with the knowledge and understanding acquired, you go back to your country, your behavior may not be as good with your parents. Your parents will not like it. So I advise you not to sit here. If I try to really care about my parents in the way that I care about myself, to know myself, then the only way to be of any use to my parents is to make it clear to them that it is important to know oneself. It is not very clear exactly whether you like this robe or not. The question now is whether you like it or your parents like it. Do you like this robe? Are you satisfied with it? I trust that if they like it, I won't feel any urge or interest to change. Now what about your parents? Do they like this? If you go around in this robe, will they like it? I can't say, because I have not met my parents since wearing this robe. You come here today and tomorrow. From that day onward, you won't come any more. Tomorrow you can still come. Why is it that I can't come here? You purchased that book, the two volumes. I am that. Now you read it. A new visitor has arrived and is asking a question. I have read the Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, and did some research in prana. How is it possible to arrest the disturbing thoughts during meditation? Arrest the disturbance in thought? Yes, the disturbance in the mind during meditation. What is the disturbance? It springs from distraction. What do you mean by meditation? And what is the distraction? when you are concentrating on a mantra or on respiration, and there are many thoughts coming in and you cannot concentrate properly. You do not know what meditation is. The mind is the flow force. The mind is continuously flowing. That means the words are continuously welling up. When you do not get involved with the thought process or the flow of the words or the flow of the mind, you are not the mind. When you are in a position to observe the mind, you are other than the mind. I find it very difficult to do that. For meditation, you should sit with identification with the knowledge I am only and have confirmed to yourself that you are not the body. You must dwell only in that knowledge I am, not merely the words I am. The design of body does not signify your identification. And also the name which is given to you or to the body is not your correct identity. The name which is imposed on you or the name which you have heard about you, you have accepted that name as yourself. Similarly, since you have seen your body, you think you are the body. So you have to give up both these identities and the indwelling knowledge that you are without words that itself you are. In that identity, you must stabilize yourself. And then whatever doubts you have will be cleared by that very knowledge and everything will be opened up in you. The indwelling principle you are without words, let us call it Atman, the self. You are that self, and you are not the body. With that conviction you must meditate that I am that self only. The self or the Atman sheds the body, which event we normally call death. But to the self there is no death. I repeat. The Atman discards the body. It is the body's death, but the self or the Atman does not die. But if one says, I am the body, then surely he is going to have death. Who understands with the help of intelligence? Hold on to that who, not the intelligence. Catch that, be that. My question is, is there a useful way for arriving at moksha? And are there particular signs for distinguishing which paths are the best for us? You just listen to all this, whatever is being said here. Follow that, abide in that, and be that. Don't ask me about other paths. The path I am expounding, you listen to that, and abide in that. 
How are we supposed to come to know this? Can you not listen to the talk? Can you hear it? So as you hear it, you be that. As I said earlier, time is moving fast. Can you stop all your questions? You started very well. You asked very relevant questions. I'm interested especially in practice how to start it. Forget all about physical disciplines in this connection. I am telling you that the indwelling principle, I am, the knowledge that you are, you have to be that. Just be that. With that knowledge, I am. Hold on to the knowledge I am. It is very difficult to abandon attachment to action. Even in this way, it is not always easy to remember I am, the truth of the Atman. You know that you are sitting here. You know you are. Do you require any special effort to hold on to that you are? You know you are. Abide only in that. The I am principle without words, that itself is the God of all Ishwaras. Is devotion not useful as an initial step? First step or second step, I have the first and final step at the same time. The knowledge I am without words itself is the Ishwara. He, Ishwara, does not want another Maya, agent or intermediary, direct. The problem we are falling into is weakness of mind sometimes. This dims the awareness. Who falls a prey to the weakness of the mind? You are talking from the body identification point of view. The real you is not the body. It cannot be cut to pieces by any weapon. It is always the false identification. If you identify yourself as the body, such an identity must be let go of, sacrificed. Your real identity has no body and no thought, and that self, the spontaneous knowledge I am, you are. Since the self is not the body, the self is neither male nor female. Thus, to understand correctly, you must be bodiless. You must be bereft of the body sense. It is no use trying to understand from the identity of body. You must fulfill this vow that you are not the body, but solely that indwelling principle I am. So, in staying with that principle, there is no effort involved? What do you mean by effort? And what would you like to have, to achieve? I am still trying to be I am. You know that only. Where is the question of any effort? Effortlessly, you are that. Only you must stand for it with conviction. Effort, then, is only concerned with the sense of body consciousness, because one is still clinging to a body? It is a kind of trap. Why can't one really be in the state of I am? Because there is still some clinging, and one wants to be free from that clinging. You need not try to get yourself detached from the bodily sense. Once you abide in this, that you are the indwelling principle only and you are not the body. That is enough. When you have developed this firm conviction, where is the question of trying to get detached from the body identity? One of Maharaja's closest devotees, and also a relative of his, died a month back, so he gave the following example. That Mr. H is no more. Now I know he is not. Similarly, you must have the conviction, I am not the body. Such type of conviction you must have, that I am not the body-mind, but only that knowledge I am. If it clicks, it will click instantly. You see, I am not attached to any of you. Why I feel like that? Because I don't feel anything about my own self, and neither am I interested in this consciousness. Suppose that it quits. I am not the least concerned because I am not that consciousness. A step beyond what I am telling you to follow. First of all, we are to abide in consciousness. That is the first step. Then I am not that consciousness either. And this way of understanding should be shared in total by everybody else. Even to say understanding is not the correct word. To abide in the truth. The way I do, the same applies to everyone else. There is a couplet that states the real sage instantly transforms any devotee into himself, his true self, the Yani, and he is at that highest stage, is stabilized in the destination, in the terminus. 
he is already in his destination. And because he is firmly established in the destination, there is no movement for him. We normally talk about various paths. Paths are indicative of movement. I do not accept paths. You are in the destination itself. That is my teaching. Yet at other times, Maharaj has admitted that there is discipline involved. He said that in I am that for beginners. This also must be clearly understood that you are not a male nor a female. If at all you are going to say you are a male or a female, that means you are trying to understand yourself as a body. This happening is like an accident. Suppose there is an accident and one limb is gone. You know the limb is gone. That is a bodily expression. Similarly, to call yourself a male or a female is a bodily expression. That is, with reference to body, identification with the body. With firm conviction you abide in this knowledge I am only, bereft of body-mind sense, only I am. If you dwell therein, if you be that only, in due course it will get mature, and it will reveal to you all the knowledge, and you need not go to anybody else. Since I have been with Maharaj this week and a half past, and through this very statement that he has just made, it has become very clear to me that it is the sadhana that matters, not the gathering of concepts that mean nothing at all. They don't change anything. They don't serve your liberation in any way. They are just garbage. The only thing I feel you have to follow your profession, that is, what your body is destined to do. Meaning can happen there. Ever since I and that came into my life, that is the only teacher I have ever gone to. Until I was blessed with this opportunity to be in Maharaja's company, and I don't intend to go anywhere else. Whatever you have said, I agree with. But why is it like that? It is because the self cannot have an image. You cannot say I am like this. Beyond any verbal formulation, it cannot be consumed by the senses of the mind. Maharaj said previously that it is not a question of cleaning the mind, but only of abiding in the process that is, I am that. In the very moment, for example, that I feel a preoccupation with my work, my art, my son, or with something, in that very moment, that preoccupation, or that joy, or that sorrow, is disturbing my consciousness. I am that. Even if I know I am that, this preoccupation is the sensation that I feel. Your consciousness is getting disturbed in you. Don't drag on, tell it succinctly, but you as consciousness should not get disturbed because it cannot be touched by any conclusion outside. Because that conclusion is not consciousness. Let us suppose you have got a big bank balance, and something happens elsewhere. Your balance is not suddenly in debt, is it? Similarly, your consciousness cannot be disturbed by any disturbances. So this means that I have not this consciousness. I believe I have this consciousness, but I don't have this consciousness. That I itself is the consciousness. It is not a question of I am that consciousness. I itself is the consciousness. Only you are not to say the word. I, without any doubt whatsoever, you are. That you are, itself, is the consciousness. I have a consciousness, but I must be the consciousness, probably. This is a very subtle point now. In the morning you wake up, you know you woke up. You know the waking state now. That you, who knows the waking state, should be prior to the waking state, should it not? Yes. Now, the moment you woke up or you observed the waking state, you clung to the world as I am the body. This whole subtle thing must be understood. The principle which distinguishes or recognizes the waking state, that is the godly state. We know I woke up, clinging to the body. That is the bodily state, the individual state, which is a downfall into a grosser state, because a jiva atman is grosser than the paramatman, clinging to the body-mind as I am in the waking state. For newcomers, I am not going to repeat my lessons again and again. You must be alert and listen to the talks with perfect attention, and then practice them. 
For my own sake, my mind inclinations have almost come to a stop. There is no mind collaboration for me. Now, for the sake of the public, why should I provoke my mind to expound? It is different when you understand what I am saying, and I keep repeating, not everyone will understand me. If and when you understand, you will have come so close to me that you will realize that all this is a complete illusion, that whatever it is because of which you see things in itself is an illusion. Then you will throw up your hands and give up everything since you are convinced that it is all unreal. What is happening now is that whatever is seen is considered as something concrete and existing. And man wants to enlarge on it. Whatever he has inherited, he considers that is something solid and worth having. And he wants to increase whatever his acquisitions are. Whereas the truth is that he himself is an object, and whatever he thinks and acts on is itself an illusion. Therefore, whatever he acquires is an illusion. So man's whole view of seeing things must change radically, and only then will he understand what the truth is. This consciousness itself is the source of all mischief, because once you start having this consciousness, then that is the seed of wanting everything, having more and more wants, the insidious seed of mischief in the consciousness itself. And that is to be understood. About hearsay, people keep saying things about reincarnation, any number of births. But even the Yanni, is he aware of a single birth, that there should be talk of more than one birth? There will not be a single Yanni who can record his first birth. The concept I am is the primordial Maya, and that Maya, that primordial concept I am, requires support, and therefore God and Ishwara have been born. Along with that, the whole manifestation, the entire universe, has come upon it. Otherwise, there is absolutely nothing, and out of many yanis, there will only be a rare one who knows the real nature of this primary concept. Interpreter he says he has absolutely no need, no one of any kind left. He has not got the desire that you all should come here and listen to him. It is nothing. He is the absolute, and in that absolute he wants nothing. He needs nothing. And you will have whatever you have. It is only an entertainment for your concepts. Whenever you come here, there are various concepts within you that will entertain you. But more than that, perhaps you will not understand all that is being said. To look at him, he is an ordinary man, an ordinary body, but there has been publicity all around the world that he is a great philosopher. Therefore, all of you come. But what am I for myself? In fact, that state of the absolute is mine today, where there is neither being nor non-being. I have absolutely nothing to do with what this body is today. Whatever it has to give you is of no interest to me. So, as far as I am concerned, I am in that state where beingness and non-beingness do not matter at all. You feel if I do this, I will get that. But when you understand the truth, you will realize that there is nothing. You are not. And so, whatever you get, what does it matter? One has accused me of a very grave illness. But whatever is apprehended, and whatever is seen, is absolutely futile. I have therefore nothing to do with this. I show you this truth, but you cannot catch it. Nobody can. Today, Maharaj has been stressing more the non-being, even of himself. So I am asking, while it is true that I amness or beingness might be a time-bound thing and the result of some kind of illusion, isn't there something more real and lasting prior to emergence of this I amness? Whatever it was, that I amness has become naught. Now, whatever is left, that is the solid thing and is called Parabrahman. What was not, but still is. Swarta, swa, is self, and arta is meaning, is a pun on the Marathi word, which means selfishness, and also the meaning of the self. So, how did the selfishness come in? That swa arta means I want something for myself. As soon as this consciousness comes on, all kinds of needs and wants start. Now, before that, what was the position? 
Before this consciousness came in, I had no needs, no wants. I was whole without any needs. The needs and wanting started only when this consciousness came upon me. Once I knew the meaning of the self, I realized there is no such thing as I, as an entity. Therefore, who is to want anything? It is only while I thought I was an entity because of this consciousness that I wanted something. My needs were there. Thus, the meaning is twofold. The first is wanting something, and the second, subsequently, is not wanting anything because there is no entity to want anything. Interpreter. What he is trying to tell us is from his own intuitive experience. So what he says is the truth. But in the same breath, he is telling us that what he states about himself applies to every one of us. So if he says, as he often does, something has happened to me, or as far as I am concerned, he tries to keep us out, but at the same time is telling us that whatever his intuitive experience is, it can be the intuitive experience of every one of us. Can be. The potential. That is why we are here, and not with any philosophers. Talking about philosophers, all these philosophers, what are they doing? They are only acting philosophy. And all those concepts which are most dear to you are images of yourself. Your image of yourself is that concept which is dearest to you. Referring to one of the visitors, now he puts on these Buddha robes. What is this but concept? There's nothing else there but concept. When you go to pictures, cinemas, and dramas, what are you seeing? Are you seeing any original self there? Acting. Acting, acting. And it goes on endlessly. All playing their roles. Sometime I am like this, the other time I am like that. And is any of it true? Nothing. That which has appeared unknowingly has been taking on an infinite number of roles on itself and is moving about in the world like Brahman, Ishwara. But remember that this knowingness I am is not going to last. I am asking you to do meditation. Why? Because then that knowledge which is consciousness will unfold to us the mystery of the infant Lord Krishna. And what is this mystery? That infant Lord Krishna is this consciousness which is manifesting itself in the millions of forms. And it will come to us, or the knowledge will unfold to us, the fact that that which assumes all these forms in the world is itself really formless, spaceless, and timeless. The because of which the consciousness is able to assume these various forms is itself timeless, spaceless, without identity, unconditioned, and original. About the infant Lord Krishna, it will tell you how and why the infant body came into being, how the consciousness came into being the illusory nature of this body and the consciousness, and that the original state is timeless, formless, and that what has come about is merely an illusion. Once you realize the truth that consciousness has come over you, you will need nothing anymore. Go back to your infant form. In order to realize that that which assumes the multitude of forms and manifestation is itself absolutely without any form. Those amongst us who have heard this and taken it to heart will get to the bottom of the whole mystery. Chapter 9 Eventually you have to give up this association with the consciousness. People who think themselves to be in a position to air their knowledge forget one basic fact, namely that they go by mere appearances. Someone expounds knowledge and the one who receives it begins to ape the person from whom he has received the knowledge. Thus, whatever the teacher wears, he will wear. Whatever mannerisms the teacher affects, he will imitate. And the transfer of so-called knowledge has been only that of concepts. This is essentially how tradition becomes established and traditional forms of worship come into being, all of which has nothing to do with the basic knowledge. Whatever you have heard, Whatever you have been told will have no value as far as I am concerned. I want to know whether you accept the fact that the only knowledge that you really have is the knowledge that you are, this consciousness. Other than that, whatever knowledge you think you have is mere hearsay, something acquired, 
based on that illusory consciousness. Is that so, or is it not so? To me it is so. The knowledge has radically stripped away the baggage with which I came here. I just don't have any interest in it anymore. What is left is the basic concept that I am. That is the only concept that remains, and even that has to go. If you encourage it, it will build up all kinds of burdens. If you ignore it, it will go away. I feel since I have been here with Maharaj that the one thing he has drawn me back to constantly is this absolute need to dwell on the sense I am, and through that to transcend it. Anything else I can think about, say about it, do about it, will only distract me from the central command he has given me. And it is this instruction I first received by reading his books, which is only being thoroughly confirmed and strengthened in his company. It is the key which is the verbal form of his grace to me. In the end, one has to give up even the association with this consciousness itself. That is the ultimate aim. That to me is when the paradox of his teaching comes in, as one is always making this assumption about oneself. And it is like the assumption has to undo the assumption which, is, which it is making about itself. There is that unfathomable element of grace that comes into this to make one stand outside what one is always doing in the sense of defining oneself as this I am. It can't be expressed. He who starts the search along a spiritual path expects to get something. But when he understands what I am saying, then the very need for something vanishes. Expectation itself disappears. One who will die with his ties of affection for the family, he will not be able to understand the gist of this matter, the secret of this knowledge. The ultimate conclusion one arrives at, if one understands the teaching correctly, is that there is nothing like an entity, I. Then where is the question of anyone wanting anything? So whether it is something worldly or unworldly, where is the question at all of anything to be sought? And by whom? Consciousness has come upon one by itself, spontaneously. And that which has come spontaneously will go away in the same manner. So what is it that I can consider as my identity? That this consciousness has come upon you unwittingly, spontaneously? Is it or is it not a fact? It is absolutely true. I have nothing to do with the rising or falling of this consciousness. Maharaj was talking about desire this morning and how for a man who is completely liberated, his home is the absolute and desire comes to an end. What I am wondering is whether that is the case in absolute sense. It seems to me that as long as this body beingness is in existence, there will always be desires arising. Do they have a more lawful nature and do not bind for the man who is liberated? Or is it that desire truly comes to an end, and the only urges that arise are purely for survival of his body-mind? The Yanni may do whatever he likes. Outwardly it may appear that he has desires and is trying to fulfill them. But ultimately, when he knows that he has no identity, he is the absolute. Then who is going to benefit from these desires? Who is even concerned with them? The force of desire is undone. That is clear. After listening to this talk, what do you feel about yourself? There are still desires arising in me that I am not free from. That is very clear. And also that this body-mind has its destiny. The main message, to me, of his teaching, is that a life in the world and a life of service are perfectly compatible with the spiritual practice which he recommends, and the desires that still arise will lose their force not because of any manipulation on my part, but simply because I turn to this practice instead of the desires. If you consider yourself to have a name and form to have an identity, then the desires will have an effect on you. But when you know that you really do not have any design, no color, no name, no form, then on whom will these desires have an effect? So often people, when they begin a spiritual practice, get very upset. It is commonly reported when you come in the graceful company of a spiritual master that these desires seem to get intensified rather than magically dissipated. 
And it is like Maharaj two or three days ago was talking about the life force being intensified and this purification taking place. What he was saying to me was that there is nothing you can do about these desires. This is what I have understood from his teaching. The only thing we can do is to turn to this practice with more sincerity, more intensity, and just leave the desires to themselves. It is not necessary to willfully ignore the desires. Just give attention to your eye consciousness. That is enough. In the food essence, the pulsation of the vital breath occurs. And the vital breath contains this beingness, that touch of I amness. And that touch of I amness, or this consciousness, with the help of the body and the vital breath, carries out all the activities in the world. If the consciousness were not there, nobody would feel the vital breath. In this organization, what is your identity? What are you? I am that which observes. From what I hear Maharaj saying, it is not that the vital breath in the liberated state comes to an end. Obviously, its play is still present in Maharaj. You are observing what? The play of the vital breath in the body. At the same time, do you not also observe the consciousness? When the vital breath is there, the consciousness is also there. That consciousness or that I amness is termed Ishwara, godly. When the vital breath is gone, that godly principle is also gone. The presence of the animating force that this vital breath represents to us, the time I most observe its action is when I'm doing what Maharaj tells me. In that sense of I am, one feels all sorts of things happening in the body that are not normally noticed. I'm not sure if that is what he is asking. I am asking whether you are observing consciousness also. You say you are in a position to observe the vital breath and its actions through the body, the bodily activities. I feel it can't be observed, the consciousness. Can you observe consciousness also? How do you know that you are? The consciousness knows. The body does not know. I think consciousness gets used in many different ways. To me, consciousness is awareness itself. I know you use it, the word, in a different, more specific sense, but this is the way it is for me. No, I, I don't feel consciousness is like a thing you can observe. I think this type of definition of I amness is a gift you want to know. Do you observe consciousness? Do you observe I amness? I amness, yes, sometimes. For many hours you are witnessing the consciousness, that I amness. What this means is that you know that you are, that is all. Witnessing means just that. Since you know you are, you know all other things. First, the knowingness knows itself, knowing that I am. And in the illumination by that I amness or that consciousness, everything else is observed. I have had to repeat the same lesson again and again, and I do not want to run kindergarten classes of spirituality. Interpreter People go to visit and have a look at the sages. They are not interested in getting knowledge, especially not this kind of profound spiritual knowledge. So Maharaj is saying, since most of our people are like that, you can just tell them you have seen me and you better go now. He will not presently invite newcomers. Previously, out of sheer exuberance, he used to invite people and say, Come on, you received this. Those days are gone. He is in the state now in which there is no question of God and a devotee, a yani, and people wanting to listen to him. That difference is already gone. So why should he bother about anything? From this standpoint, nothing is, everything is illusion, all of which he has already expounded in great detail. Sometimes it is just a matter of terms, not one of misunderstanding, and sometimes I think when Maharaja's teaching is put in English, more attention should be paid to using terms consistent with the way that most people understand them. Otherwise, the full force of those teachings will be lost. Interpreter, these translations are in his own vocabulary of spirituality. People have had to revert completely to use the Sanskrit words and then spending pages trying to explain them. There just are not that many words in English to explain what Maharaj is expounding. Interpreter, English English is different from American English. That I know because I was brought up with English English. Interpreter, 
We too have a number of difficulties. Take the word Vijana, for example. Vijana is used in physics and other sciences, but here that word is used as absolute knowledge. Ayana is the lowest, that is ignorance. Yana is knowledge, and Vijana is transcending knowledge according to Maharaj. You see, this I amness is normally this five elemental interaction and play. Out of the earth, with the help of water, sprouting of vegetation takes place. Out of vegetation, the essences are drawn. Out of the essences, which are the food for all beings, come the grains for human beings. Now, from the quintessence of this food, the I amness is sustained. The food is stored in the form of a body. The food is continuously consumed by the vital breath. And in the process of consuming this food, the vital breath sustains that flame of I amness. To have I amness, the food body and vital breath are very necessary. In short, one may say it is a product of food body essence and vital breath. Then only this I amness or consciousness is available. Now, the consciousness, when it gets involved with the body mind, is the individual. It is conditioned by body and mind. Mind is concepts, whatever it receives through the five senses and is stored. That is the mind. And what of the words that flow out, that is also mind. So, when that consciousness is conditioned by the body and the mind, it is individualistic, a personality. And I always tell people, you depersonify yourself by not identifying with the body-mind. When you do that, you are that manifest principle. You are no more personality, you are only consciousness. When you are in that consciousness state, you are in a position to observe the mind flow. Any thoughts occurring to you, you are apart from thought. You don't identify with that thought. Since you observe the body and its actions, you are not one with those. You are apart from that body. Thus you are now in consciousness. That is the first stage. So when you are only consciousness, you are all manifest. This is to be realized. Then provided you are, everything is, your world is, and your God is. You are the primary cause, the prerequisite for anything else to exist, whether it be your God, or your world. You abide only in consciousness. In your attention, only consciousness should be there. That is meditation. Now, the next step, the question raised in the morning, are you in a position to observe consciousness? This is also the final step. When you are in a position to observe or witness consciousness, and of course the vital breath, body, and its actions, then by virtue of that very observation, you are apart from the consciousness. Maharaj has mentioned this on other days, like the first step is getting established in this awareness of I am and being confirmed, strengthened, and stabilized in that condition. Then one is in a position to witness what one always assumes oneself to be. So when you are in a position to observe consciousness, you are out of consciousness. Then you are what we call the awareness state, the vijana or yana state. It is firmly stabilized in you, or are you still wavering, vacillating? This central sense of I amness has become much firmer since I have been here. Without me having to go home, get my book out twice a day, read it, and then remember what I should be doing. I find I am being naturally drawn to it time and again during the day. Is it not possible to remember that witnessing of the consciousness is to be done or is to happen? After reading the book, I am that. You are not able to conclude that witnessing of the consciousness is necessary? Suppose you just got married. Thereafter you know you are different somehow. Your status has changed. You witness your wife. You know you are a husband. Similarly, after reading the book, you know consciousness is there. Is it the consciousness, not witnessing the consciousness? Reading is one thing, but actually applying it to yourself is another thing. Having understood my talks, are you able to fathom your own identity? Could your identity dawn upon yourself? At moments, yes. 
like the sun coming up at dawn, our overwhelming sense of it. Can you understand the dawn? Before the sunrise, can you understand sunrise? Intellectually, yes. Not at all. You can't witness it. The knowledge I am, has it drawn a tangible or perceptible image? Is it very clear, this particular point? Then how are you going to carry out your normal worldly activities? Since you know that you have no innate form, no design, how are you going to carry out deliberately your responsibilities? I am not going to carry them out, they are just going to go on. Have you been able to erase completely that symbol of birth that you represent? Not completely, no. Then how can you state that you have got the knowledge? I am not claiming for a minute that this is stable. It is, I am just saying that at times the sense of what Maharaj is talking about is overwhelmingly clear. You apparently feel you have understood the meaning of the words, but what is it that you have understood? For now you might beam that ecstatic mood, but how long is it going to last? That blissful moment. It is like a flame, depending on the fuel. Ecstasy is bound in time. What is not time bound? The experience that you are is time bound. You know you are. It is a time bound state. Consciousness means a time bound state, and time appears spontaneously. This consciousness or I amness is the time, which I call Kala. Kala means time. With the appearance of consciousness, the ticking of time started. All this is the play of the concepts. This primary concept, I am, appears spontaneously. It likes I am. It loves that I am state. Devouring ever more concepts, it gets totally enmeshed in them. And what is the source of all these concepts? This primary feeling I am. But never forget the fact that it is itself a concept, time-bound. So it is all mental entertainment. The world is an illusion, not eternal. Why is it unreal? Because none of the knowledge is going to remain permanently as real knowledge. I had a number of identities. I was a child. I was a boy. I was a teenager. I was a middle-aged man. I was an old man. Like other identities that I thought would remain constant, they never remained so. Finally, I became old, and then I had to be fed, you know, with a bottle. So which identity remained honest with me? About the maturity you get with age, although on one side you get more mature, the other side gets chopped off, cut off. At one side I have aged so much, grown with age, but at the other side I have cut off the remaining life. Whatever I had collected as my own, as knowledge, I have finally discarded. And nothing remains with me at the moment of death. Everything is gone. Right from childhood to old age you have various associations, physical, mental, and conceptual. These associations will not remain with you till the end. All are passing phases. Finally, the association of I amness, which you presume to have with you constantly, is in the end also going to quit you, because that, too, is time-bound. Thus, when the body drops, that I am feeling which had been there from childhood also leaves. So that which is eternal and the truth is something beyond the grasp of the five elements. It transcends all five elemental states. Whatever is being witnessed is constantly changing. Only the changing state is being witnessed, but the witness is not changing. And when finally witnessing stops completely, there is the eternal state. This riddle will not be solved until you get the knowledge of your birth. How is that possible? Don't ask me. Inquire within yourself. That knowledge about your birth you must definitely have. True, but in this world, even if you are on the right path, or if you do good, you never get what you deserve. What you think proper in the morning becomes improper in the evening. The principle which knows that is not even contained in the book I am that. It does not have that information. What is that principle? No book can contain it. No words can describe it. 
If you understand that it is beyond all words, then would you have that pride or ego that you are realized if you are realized? There will be no room for it. Interpreter. To drive home that point, he does not just go along with the questioner, but takes an opposite line of argument, playing as it were a special kind of devil's advocate. That is his great service to us. If we still have an image that we want to present to him, we need to see that. He makes us feel it very strongly. If we truly heard and realized what he was saying, there would be no insecurity. There would be nothing in us that he could threaten. Yet there is. If that happiness in which there is no room for ego were truly ours, there would be no insecurity left in us, no fear, no anxiety. What I feel we have to pray for from his grace is to have the same impatience with ourselves as he sometimes shows us, and yet great patience is there at the same time. That will depend on your sense of urgency, your earnestness. Without the vital breath, Ishwara or God has no soul, and without God the vital breath has no existence. Whenever man limits his consciousness to body and mind, he is called Jiva. Otherwise, he is absolutely independent of these two which are acting and reacting. Consciousness, which expresses itself in various shapes and forms, is all one, whether it be an insect, a big boar, or a big man. There is no difference whatsoever. Without the vital force, nobody can worship God. Actually, it is the vital breath, the life force, which is worshiping God. And without God, there is no existence of the vital breath. And without vital breath, there is no expression to God. Without this vital force, would there be even a reference to God? When this life force seeks the consciousness as God itself, then dawns the light of the consciousness with which the life force works and achieves what it wants to achieve. That is, oneness with God. Even if you take the life force as God itself, the result will be the same, because the working principle is the life force. The consciousness is merely the witnessing process. When the life force carries on without any obstacles, then one is not even aware of this life force, since it moves so freely, and therefore you have a sense of well-being. You are happy. If there is an obstruction, you become aware of a disturbance in the working of the life force, and you have a feeling of unwellness, and you are unhappy. People are generally asked to do a certain sadhana, and as part of that, go somewhere, visit this or that temple, or climb such and such a mountain. But what is really the working principle is the life force. And when you treat the life force as God itself, there cannot be consciousness without life force. So consciousness and life force are two components, inextricably woven together, of one principle. But consciousness is only the witnessing principle, or the static aspect. The dynamic aspect, or the working principle, is the life force. Once you consider that life force as God itself, and that no other God exists, then you raise the life force to a status, enabling it together with consciousness to give you an understanding of the working of the whole principle. But if you demote that life principle to mere self-identification with the body, then the life principle is not given the status which enables it to unfold itself. It depends entirely on you. If I identify this life principle with my body, then I make it work according to the body. But if I raise it to a godly status and treat it as such, then that life principle will unfold itself and give me the necessary spiritual knowledge. Earlier, I had asked, what is mine? Mine is only the outflow in words of this life principle, the prana. And how does the mind work? The mind is limited to the conditioning to which it has been exposed. Therefore, the mind cannot go beyond the specific molding it has undergone in the individual. Thus, the working of the mind differs from case to case. And about this prana, you have been asked to pray to such and such a God. So what does one really have in mind? Only the words, the designation allotted to that God. But one forgets the principle and sticks merely to the words. 
but without the life force and consciousness, the words themselves would not come. Therefore, instead of identifying oneself with and praying to some word which has been given to denote the life principle, pray to that life principle itself. Earlier I had quoted a couplet in Marathi, which says that that which is one's constant companion every moment of the day is the consciousness. Can anyone think of a single moment without this consciousness? So this is our friend which is with us for twenty-four hours a day. So pray to that constant companion of yours, and not to some imaginary conceptual God. In my own case, with the life force not working so smoothly, what can anybody's medicine do? All that it can do is to try to make that life force work more smoothly. Now, going back to that old couplet, which says that this companion of mine, friend, philosopher, and guide, who takes me by the hand every moment of my existence, is this very high life force. Other than God, what companion can it be? Although the one who wrote it is probably thinking in terms of some conceptual God. Think for yourself. Who is this God who is your companion every moment of your existence? What can it be other than this life force and the consciousness? People pray to God, and when they think they do so, what are they praying to? Is it some idol made of a material? Maybe gold, maybe silver, maybe something else. But have you come across anyone praying to an idol representing the life force? This physical body, this apparatus, is generally regarded very highly. The doctors will say, anyone will say, that this physical body is a marvel. But can the body, however good, however pure, be as pure as the life force? If you make a friend of this life force, that is, if you identify yourself not with the body, but with this life force, then will one need help from any other source? That is, from any source other than the life force. Is there anything more essential than this life force? If you have a choice by which you could have the life force or anything else, is there anything that you would give preference over the life force? Well, the making of that choice itself would depend upon the presence of the life force anyway. That is the point I am trying to make. That is why this constant companion is this life force, without which nothing can happen. When the life force comes into contact with the consciousness, this combination assumes the status of the highest God. That is, for one who has identified himself not with the body, but with this life force, can there be the need for anything else from any source? Has anyone been advising people along these lines? The life force plus consciousness? which has assumed any number of forms, is that meant for any one particular form, or is it for the total manifestation, the totality of sentient beings? In other words, I don't have the life force, but the life force has this one form, along with millions of others. Has anyone made any capital of any kind in order to pray to and please this life force? You don't need anything to pray to this life force. This principle has, deliberately or otherwise, generally been kept a secret from people who seek spiritual knowledge. For all these forty-odd years, I have been giving attention to individual persons. But now, I have not got the time, the strength or the stamina to deal with particular individuals. I will only talk generally, and people can make the best of whatever they hear. If someone does not like it, he can go. My feeling is that if we hear him, generally, all these niggardly little personal problems will take care of themselves anyhow. Previously, I asked if there was a choice. Would a husband prefer his life force to his wife? Would a wife prefer her life force to her husband? So far, we have been using the expression, praying, to the life force. So I ask, can anyone live without the vice? Now I am deliberately using the word vice of the companionship of the life force. I am employing the word in this way. The life force is the yoking, like of a bullock or a horse. In the absence of this joining with the life force, can anyone act at all in any way? If I decide to go somewhere, but my life force is not functioning too well and therefore I am ill, 
then will I be able to go even with all the determination in the world? So ultimately, even though I may think I am acting or doing something, it is the life force within which is driving me to or preventing me from doing something. Millions of rupees have been spent in preparing an idol of gold or whatever the most precious metal. But if I don't have the life force, does it matter to me whether the idol is made of earth or gold, or that there is even an idol at all? So long as the life force is there, whether in a fit working condition or not, whether well or unwell, the body is alive. But once the life force leaves, the person is dead. Therefore, everything depends on the life force. Would you like to ask some questions? Who is eligible to ask questions? It is that one who has made deep friendship with this life force and this consciousness, who realizes the importance of the life force to the extent that he loves the life force as himself and not his identification with the body. Someone who has this love and has not identified himself with the body he has conquered everything, and such a person only is eligible to ask questions. The union with this life force is in no way different from the love for the life force. The companionship with the life force, that is, this unity is love. Life force, love, and consciousness are all one in essence. By all means, use your body to work in the world, but understand what it is. The body is only an instrument to be used. You are not the body. You are the everlasting, timeless, spaceless principle which gives sentience to this body. This is the most secret but the simplest principle as far as spiritual knowledge is concerned. I will give you a specific instance in one who has understood the principle and is one with the life force. When this life force is ready to leave the body, what will be his reaction? Apparently, that will be the moment of highest ecstasy. Why is this? Because what is manifest is now going to be unmanifest. What was said is to happen in the case of a yani at the moment of death. However, it should really happen in the present moment when life is there, and not only at the moment of death. That is extraordinarily difficult because a very slight identification with the body remains. It is extremely hard to get rid of that remnant of identification. Words are used only as a means of communication at any particular moment. Time, space, whatever objects in the manifestation, are they not there because of the same principle? Manifestation is possible only if the life force is there. Then only is it sensorially perceptible. If the life force is not there, as far as that particular individual is concerned, there is no manifestation, there is no earth, there is no love, there is nothing. The concepts we have carefully accumulated over a time will all be useless. It is this life force's conscious presence, without any form, which has been called God in various names. We have to repeat the fact to ourselves that I am not the body, but the life force and consciousness. That is my nature. In order to know that, one does not have to practice anything. It is there, as an innate fact. Only after this consciousness has come upon me, I am aware of various kinds of needs and wishes and ambitions, happiness and unhappiness, pain and lack of pain. Everything is only subsequent to the appearance of this consciousness. Before that, there was nothing. The gentleman says he has come here to seek exactly what I am talking about. Of course, who will come to me for any other purpose? Self-identification, that is, identification with the body, is so powerful that I wonder how much of what I say will have any effect. And I do not blame you either. There is no limit to the extent of worldly knowledge that can be acquired. But all that is traditional knowledge which refers only to the world. To collect all that knowledge which has come down from the ages, one forgets who or what is really at the root of all this knowledge, that principle because of which knowledge of any kind can be acquired. If one travels in the world, one must have all kinds of knowledge to make that travel pleasant and successful. But if one is not a traveler, 
but merely a witness of the travel that takes place. Why do I need knowledge of any kind? The physical construct which has been created as a protection for the life force, one accepts that as oneself. That is the whole difficulty. Knowledge in the world is helpful only to the traveler. If there is any unworldly knowledge, it must be of one's true nature. Coming to the theoretical knowledge that I am Brahman is possible only if one would stick to the much easier and simpler practice of making friendship with this life force itself. In saying I am the life force, progress would be very much faster. Falls, accidents happen, bodies get crushed, there is loss of life and limb. But the life force is unaffected. Whoever has made this world and is concerned with its working is not worried about it because there are innumerable forms which are ever created for the life force to work in. So if a few of them get crushed, the creator is not worried. Are pranayama and this making friendship with life force the same thing? Pranayama is a practice for achieving this goal. The son of a guru is not a proper son if he gives more importance to what somebody else says than what his own father says. In coming here, are you not belittling the status and importance of your own guru? Is he angry about it? Interpreter. Not angry, but clarifying the situation. If a pupil considered God to be higher than his guru, then again he is not a proper pupil, not a proper seeker. But who is conscious of this fear of death? Second visitor. The thoughts. Which are? Who understands the process of thought? The mind. Who understands the mind? What is there prior to mind? I don't know. There must be something, because it is holding the thoughts. Yes. Therefore, I am asking you, what is it? That there is something. When do you have to say it? You know there is something, but you do not know what it is. You are able to say this or anything else only when you have the sense that you are, the consciousness that you exist. So stick to that, that consciousness which tells you that you are. Give up your identity with the body and concentrate your thoughts on the self, that consciousness which gives sentience to the body. He means we are not body and mind? Who has heard this? You're saying that you are not the body. You have said that you are not the body. So who is it that has heard this and understood it? I have heard it, but not understood it. You say, I have heard it. But who is this I? Who is it that has heard this? Uh, here, I am sitting. Now you are sitting here. You know that you are sitting here. So who or what principle is it that knows and understands you are sitting here. For a confirmed fact, there is no doubt about it. The answer is that the ego is this identification with your body. But I want to go prior to that. How can I lose identification with body and mind? What is the principle because of which you know that you exist and because of which you see the body in the world? What is it in the absence of which you would not be able to see your body and the world outside. But I am still doing it here. I will not insult your guru, because this is the basic question, and the answer to this question must come from your guru. Put this question to him. It must come from the guru, or must it come out from myself? Whatever the guru will tell you is the same as that which comes out of your own self. That which you are seeking within you is the same as your guru. It means the guru and myself is existence itself. The difficulty with you is that you consider yourself as your body, and you consider the guru's body as guru. That depends on my eyes. I can see only the outside. Unless you recognize and understand that principle which enables you to see the world, how can you understand anything? It is the same basic question. Giving you the answer will mean insulting your guru, which I do not intend to do. Did Maharaj get the answer from his guru? Do I have to give you the answer to the question whether my mother had a husband? How are you concerned? You can't get knowledge by seeking answers to such questions. 
what equipment you are having is that prana. Upasana means worship, worship of prana. For doing that, what equipment do you possess? It is prana itself. Along with prana, there is that knowledge I am or the consciousness. These two things are available to you to do anything. Nothing more than that. What I understood was that we honor, we worship that life force by giving attention to the consciousness. That is okay. That is the way. I consciousness or that knowledge I am is great God. The Ishwara principle. And that prana, vital force, is great power or great energy. The kinetic principle without which there cannot be consciousness. Then the knowledge I am or the consciousness is the most needed, the most coveted thing. Everybody wants to sustain that. Hence all the efforts. That is the first thing. Along with that you need so many other things. But the first requirement is that consciousness itself, the self-love. As long as you don't have the understanding of what you are, all the efforts and trouble are inevitable. They are automatically there. But once you get an inkling of what it is that you really are, there is no need for any effort or for any trouble to arise. In the earliest stages there is self-love, but that love is formless. In the later stages, even that self-love goes. Then witnessing occurs of the self-love being absent. I am describing my state. It is something like a hollow stick, a hollow tube. No self-love being present. The love for existence has vanished. Yet existence is there, and activities are taking place, like Brahma, Vishnu, or Ishwara. I have not taken any pose or stance because there is no material to support it. People come here and some do not understand. They argue, quarrel with me, fight with me. To them I say, okay, you are right. You need not attend anymore because you cannot understand me. The reason for that is your identification with the body, which you are unable to let go of. People will talk to me. They will do so only when something occurs to them. Some concept occurs and the words start flowing. So whatever question someone poses depends upon what occurs to him at that moment. That person will identify himself with the body. He has formed the conviction that he is the body. And from that standpoint, he is asking the question, But should I consider you to be a body while I am talking to you? How is that possible? So the questioner is full of color and design, whereas the one who replies has neither. How can they possibly agree? How can the questions and replies ever relate to each other? 